Welcome, welcome to another edition of Black Press USA's FIRE program. We are really excited to introduce you to our guests that will be joining us tonight. First, we have a really, we just want to give her a big warm hug and lots of love. Her name is Robin Jones Ruth, and she's a newlywed. So thank you so very much for coming on the show, fresh hey. off your wedding. <laughs> thank you guys so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Yes, newlywed about a week now, but it's uh, um, been exciting. <laughs> oh, I just love it. And in my guests and my um, listeners and viewers may be saying, Give her a big hug. Why? Well, Robin <laughs> is a career nurse. Um, and with the fact that we're still dealing with the pandemic, things are getting better, of course, here in the U.S. and in some places uh, internationally. Um, I just all medical professionals. I wish I could just give them a big hug. Um, yes. What they have been through. I don't know if there was any way that you guys could have ever planned or thought that something like this would happen and last as long as it did here in the U.S. Yes, you're absolutely right. This is something that we've never seen in our career before. So it took everybody by surprise. And just watching um, the country go through the adjustment of having COVID and then people dying, and we really didn't know what to do. But um, that kind of is why I started you know, working on this project. And I've been in nursing for um, over 30 years. And to have seen something like this in my lifetime, it, it's been life changing. So what was your specialty? Well, I work in what they call um, kidney dialysis. I work with renal patients, patients that um, have to um, have dialysis because their kidneys no longer work. And so now I'm actually in the education department where I'm you know, putting together different um, programs and processes. And I work with new nurses as well as new physicians. So, you know, being a nurse, there's a side of people like you that are just caregivers, forever caregivers. Yes. Always. So I know yeah, right, exactly. And then to have that as a nine to five. So pretty much you're probably a caregiver 24 seven because whether yes. it's at home or at work, um, I know that there was a report <laughs> that just recently came out and basically stated how nurses and doctors and people in the medical field are getting burnt out and needing some yeah. type of mental assistance to deal with the pressures of being on as long as you guys have been. Yes, and they've talked about this for years. That's why we got so many shift options as far as, you know, early morning, late night, 10 hour mm -hmm. shifts, eight hour shifts, 12 hour shifts. But when COVID came in, I mean, that was totally, that totally changed the game because it was all hands on deck. And mm -hmm. then we were dealing with a lot of mental health issues and challenges, just like, you know, normal people, because it was an isolation time where we were going through not being able to be with our families as well as, you know, taking care of the patients and being the total caregiver. Because it's a blessing when family is involved in care because they come in and they really, um, you know, spend time with their loved one because it's scary being in the hospital. But when sure. COVID came in, all of those things changed. So it really put a lot of weight on the healthcare team as well as other members, you know, staff in the hospitals. So Robin, you've been a nurse for 30 years. And in addition to that, we said that you're married, so you've been a wife, you're a caregiver, uh, you're a nurse, and now we can add film producer, director, and even actor. Am I correct? Yes. Yes. Um, it, How it, did that happen? <laughs> that's, a, that's a big jump, right? Yeah, it is a huge jump, but I can tell anybody, um, film and nursing, they marry very well together. I never would have okay. thought that they did. But what happened, I was getting ready to write a book about five years ago, and one of my childhood friends from Florida uh, called and was telling me about the film industry. He was getting ready to get involved in a project called A Turnaround in Orlando. I'm originally from Tampa, Florida. Okay. And so I'm in Virginia now. But anyway, I listened to what he had to say, and I thought it was interesting, but I was like, I don't know what anything about film. But I listened to him and I told him to get the team on the line. I wanted to kind of see, you know, what the project was all about. And lo and behold, um, the guy, James Hunter, we had an awesome talk and he sold me on the on the um, project. But I didn't know um, that he had some health challenges. And when I flew down on set, found out he was um, paralyzed in a wheelchair. But he was brilliant, you know, talking to him on the phone and he was, you know, selling me the film and, and it was turnaround and it was about, you know, young men turning their life around. And I was really, you know, captivated by that. But nevertheless, started working with him and I really got a love for film and it took off from there. So it's been 
about five years. And most of my projects connect with people that have health challenges and the mm -hmm. storyline could be something to do with the healthcare field as well. But, you know, I also do horror and faith based, you know, it's pretty broad. Oh, wow. Yeah, that. OK, you surprised me on the horror. But we're we're going to get to some of that. So, oh, yeah, <laughs> you said you were going to write a book. So what was the book about or going to be about? Actually, it was going to be about my life. I did a short film called it Showing Up Changed My Life. And um, it actually um, was recognized in the Richmond Film Festival last year. And it was just a short synopsis of my life and how you have to show up because you never know who you're going to meet and what's going to happen. You know, a lot of times people invite you someplace and you'd be like, I don't want to go. But every time I go, it is just amazing. And that kind of goes back to how I met my husband. But that's a whole nother story. But ah. um, <laughs> but with it's a just happy ending. <laughs> yes, with a happy ending. But it's just really important to, um, you know, when somebody gives you an opportunity, just like you guys have with me today, sometimes you don't know what's going to happen, but you just trust the process. I pray mm -hmm. a lot. And, and, you know, it's just been amazing so far with people wanting to know about this project that salutes nurses. I think that's special. Michelle Madison had a comment up as you were talking. Hopefully. Yes. Here. My daughter, Dr. Camille Ma, is a doctor and the pandemic has been stressful for us all. I try to help out with my young grandchildren to keep I'm them busy and positive. Mm -hmm. God bless all health care workers. Aww. Michelle, you said it best. Really? Thank really? you so much. It and, and what's amazing, we had Nurses Week in May and they extended it to the whole month of May. And that's why I was doing a lot of interviews because I wanted to salute the nurses. And we lost a lot of nurses during the yes. pandemic. And it, it has been hard on the families as well as the medical team. And so we thought, you know, with Nurses Week coming, it would be this huge celebration because of what happened in 2020. Sure. But we've been very disappointed because um, it wasn't recognized and we've lost people just like you lose in war. And so it's been hard on the healthcare team. So I really wanted to do these interviews and also share this project because they are heroes. I okay. feel like I'm, I'm a hero, I'm a nurse, but I wasn't on the front line, but I was that person that was hearing all of these issues that were going on. And in my role, we try to help and develop processes to help them through it because they had to stay present and healthy to take care of the patients. So important. So the project is 2020 Year of the Nurse, and we actually have a clip from that. So let me play that clip. And then Robin, can we talk more and more about one-on-one uh, -on -one about that after we played the clip? Absolutely. Okay, great. I don't think people will ever be able to grasp what New York was unless they were there. To walk down the ER and see stretchers in the hallways and you don't know if patients are alive or dead. It took a couple of weeks to realize how people presented. What you found out is that you can predict who's going to die. And I'm not talking about just nurses, I'm talking doctors, I'm talking environmental staff, case managers, social workers, people out because they're sick with this. So my fear was, am I next? A lot of those nurses will die from this because they do not have the appropriate equipment. And then came the, wow, we were the most trusted profession. We thought we were the most loved as well. For black people, two pandemics collided. On May 25th, 2020, the Minneapolis police officer, Derek Chauvin, killed George Floyd. All of this stuff has been going on for decades. The only difference is that it's being filmed. It is very difficult to deal with the pandemic and the Black Lives Matter movement. Ahmaud Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd. We've all had to face the difficulties that led up to, to this movement. People do not realize how mentally and physically exhausted the profession is. Mental health for me right now is hidden behind a smile and a happy face. 
I'm quick to tell people, oh, you need to go see somebody. You know, they got medication for that. And meanwhile, I'm sitting here suffering in silence. Oh my goodness. Listen, you said, you know, you're tuning in to an NPA and Black Press USA. My guest tonight is Robin Jones Roots, and she is the producer, director, and actor in um, 2020 Year of the Nurse. That was just a snippet of your production. First of all, I have to tell you, for this to be your first production, you have an incredible team. Really well Thank put together. Thank you so much. Really yes. well put together. Um, I felt what these nurses were saying, and I'm sure that each one of them represent hundreds, if not thousands of nurses across the country, across the world. Absolutely. And that's what was so powerful for me when COVID hit, running around, um, just watching people trying to figure out what, what to do, because as the government, we didn't know, you know, how to manage this CDC. Everybody's trying to find ways, but the numbers are going up. And so to watch um, the medical team, and, and I felt like throughout my career, we were always pretty confident. You know, we could identify a problem and come up with a treatment plan and treat, and then the patient goes home or, you know, we send them out for further care. But when, when COVID hit, it was a lot of gloom and doom all over the hospital, all over the country. And so as a healthcare provider, I did not know what to do because my peers were coming to me as well with their stories and the fear that they had. I mean, you could see it in their face. And so I started just writing stuff down. And finally, one night God spoke to me and told me I needed to do something. And so I pulled together my team and I started following different nurses online that were doing some amazing things during COVID. And also nurses that were right on the front line. And I had an opportunity to ask them individual questions, not knowing what they would say, because I know how I felt. But it was sure. amazing for me to hear the stories. And then when Black Lives Matters hit during COVID, that, that changed the game even more. Because now yeah. you, got, you, you got that fear of COVID and then you got fear of young black men and young black people being killed during this time and so it was just a very emotional time and all i could do was was take notes and and just try to feel it from their angle and then i finally just started asking people and doing this film it was very few days that we didn't cry however when it was done they thanked me for the opportunity to be heard because nobody was really saying how are you doing they know you're going to work and some of them can't even come home. They were staying in hotels or staying in their cars so they wouldn't infect their family. Oof. But we're not, we're not used to isolation. That's why That's there's right. a prison system. We, we're not used to isolation. So it was hard for um, people to navigate how they felt because they were alone. And then when people did test positive or they thought they were positive, they were isolated again. So we didn't prepare for all of this. That's why now we got all this um, mental health issues. We got meditation. We, we've seen all kind of yoga and stuff implemented into society to help us all because nobody thought they would feel this way being isolated, working from home when you're used to working with 30 people. Even though, you know, there's always drama at work. But when you're in your house <laughs> by yourself, it's, it's social socializing is what we do and then yes. not being go to your place of worship that was huge mm -hmm. you know that's where we go and we pray and we get hugs and you know get get re re refueled for the next week right. so um just having the opportunity to meet with all of these nurses and some of them i have never met face to face because i found them mm -hmm. on social media screened them and they were interested in the project and i asked everybody the same questions and um it, it's a powerful project it's, it's, it's highlighting and inciting challenges that we have and have had in real time. This is a documentary, it's real time. What do you hope becomes of your 2020 year of the nurse? I hope to inspire more people to get into nursing, stay in nursing, because people are leaving because of COVID and the challenges because they didn't feel appreciated and also educate the public on what, what our job really is like. Because a lot of times um, you see the nurse and she check the blood pressure and you know make sure the, the patient gets their food and stuff. They don't really realize what all happens in a day's time. 
you know, we we might go to work and two people might pass away. Then we come home and we have to pretend that everything's okay because family don't know how to ask the question. And so it just piles up and piles up. And over time you say, you know, what happened to that nurse? You know, she mm -hmm. could be having some mental health challenges, but I think different professions um, have been dealt with differently from nursing. Firemen, police officers, military people, they focus on PTSD, they focus on um, post care after they've been in certain situations. But with nurses, we're like these heroes, like super women and men that they think, I think people think we can handle anything, but we're human, we're flesh. So we love what we do. We're gonna be nurses, like you said about um, 24 seven, you know, it's nothing for me to go to grocery store and somebody flash me to show me this scar or this. And I'm like, wait a minute, but you're a nurse. <laughs> They don't know what kind of nurse I am, but you a nurse. Right. So right. it's it's I'm praying that people will watch this and walk away with a true appreciation of nurses and salute nurses and also understand how much we love what we do because um in the film you'll hear statements, we had to be everything to the patients, which we love our patients. But when you're there by yourself and you can't have the family come in and give the last goodbyes. You know, it's it's a lot. And we take that home. We take it to our heart because we love what we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, Robin, I think another thing that people may or may not know about the nursing profession, it is tough to get into a school and to be accepted and then to really graduate. So you yes. really have to be on your P's and Q's. You learn the same things that physicians learn. I think people may um, not know that. And, and that's a great point. I have met a lot of people in my life that did not make it through nursing. And, um, you know, you try, you work with them, but nursing is a calling. Mm -hmm. And and there's something about it because you're a lifelong learner. What you learn in school this year it, it's changed for next year. And you know, sure. you can look at it, you can compare it to technology, how sure. how the phones have come in and how they change every year. Medicine mm -hmm. is like that. And I think with COVID, so many people have come into um, an awareness of what the CDC does and how medicine works. So, you know, everything um, incites us and we learn from it. It can be tragedy involved with it, like what we're experiencing, but a lot of people have learned a lot of things about healthcare, COVID, vaccinations, and understanding, you know, how important that stuff is just from watching more and more news. And my fear is that COVID is still here, but it's not the number one thing being talked about. People are still dying. You know, people are still getting sick. The numbers are not as bad, but one life is, is important to me. So yeah, the our country are... hit 600,000 600, deaths here in the U.S. earlier this week. So COVID is still yeah, definitely prevalent. Still um, we have the new dom well, excuse me, not dominant. We have a new variant, the Delta mm -hmm. variant, that's in about 10% of our population. But there is some concern that in the fall, it could be the dominant strand, which could cause some different um, outcomes for people who think that they're okay. Right. And, and you know, being in the healthcare field for over 30 years, you know, I have a lot of friends that have sinus challenges okay. and throughout COVID, their sinuses have done better, most of them, because they're wearing a mask. And also mm -hmm. the flu, it didn't disappear, but the numbers went down because we had on masks. So I think yes. we learned something. If, if we look at the research, those masks might be necessary to keep us from, you know, passing different germs to one another. So me, myself, I'm still wearing a mask. Um, a lot of places I don't have to, but my family, my grandkids are too small to be vaccinated and my daughter just had a baby. So when I'm around them, they haven't been vaccinated. So I'm always on the air of protecting the people that haven't been vaccinated or can't get vaccinated, you know, and, and we right. forget about that. So um, I'm still wearing my mask everywhere I go. And, you know, some people look at me like I'm strange, but I'm I'm comfortable with it. I have to tell you, so I'm really proud. So, of course, I'm here in the DMV, D.C., Maryland and Virginia. And even though um, the mandates, uh, COVID-19 mandates have been lifted in this area, I still see people walking outside with their mask on. Um, if they're running or maybe they won't be, but I don't see right. them not wearing. They wear it in the stores. I know that there are some other southern states where there's, a, you know, sometimes confrontations between 
um, following the store's policy of when you're inside the store to wear the mask. But I've been really proud with the people here because when wearing the mask, as Dr. Fauci said, is really your way of protecting someone else. So when you're doing it, you're protecting mm -hmm. them. And when they're doing it, they're protecting you, which is a great right. thing, right? Right, a absolutely. Are, are you finding that you're getting, um, nurses are getting the help that they need or there are things changing to give them the true resources that you believe that you and the people that you've interviewed nurses that they need? Honestly, no, because um, a lot of them are mothers and caretakers for their families. So they're still in, in work mode right now because COVID okay. is still here. Right. So they're still, you know, out there taking care of the patients. They're still going home, trying to make sure every, everybody's safe. And hopefully, you know, the country is pushing self-care. So sometimes, you know, they're having a little time for themselves, but not like we need. We're hoping that um, with this documentary, because I was able to um, share it with just a few of us that, that had to review the project and the feedback was just um, amazing. Um, and they feel like it will make a difference. It will make people think. And everybody mm -hmm. was so thankful and appreciative of the nurses after seeing and, you know, coming into our world, because this has, hasn't been done before that I can recall, you know, I hear a lot of um, statements about nurses and, and kind of what we think. And you might hear something from a doctor, but um, to hear from nurses that are African-American and the practitioners that are African-American, because it's different for, for us. I, I, I really feel because of the health disparities in our communities. So even though we, we're suited up at work, when we go in our communities, we got to educate, 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 and make sure they have what they need. Because if not, you know, the rate of us passing away is higher because we don't have the mask. We're not washing our hands as much. We might see home, a lot of homeless people in our particular areas. And so we have to, you know, be a part of the community's, you know, solution as well. Robin, what would you like to see the government or counties or states do to help nurses um, deal with this, not just when, during the COVID, but once we get past this, what would you like to see? I would like to have a seat at the table mm. so that we can look at the issues that we're facing because we will have a shortage of nurses real soon okay. for multiple reasons. But now with COVID, you're not going to be insisting and in, in suggesting for your daughter or son to go to nursing school because you 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 don't live through COVID, and you don't you don't you don't feel comfortable with them there. It's just like if your son say, "Hey, I want to go to the army." When we were at war, a lot of right. parents didn't push that. So, right. you know, I I want good nurses taking care of me because we're we're living longer. That's for sure. So that's important to me to make sure that we're at the table to recruit nurses and tell them the, the, the great side of nursing, but also how we as nurses need to always be involved. So we're ready for the next pandemic because there will be another pandemic. But we sure. have to position ourselves and include the nurses because we're right on the, the floor running with with the patients, you know, the physicians are there, but the nurses are the ones that are staying eight, 10, 12 hours. They may come in for a 15 minute visit. So the nurses are there throughout the care of the patient. So now 2020 year of the nurse, where can viewers see this? How, how can they get an opportunity to see this Robin and support your project, your documentary? Well, at this time we have the trail on, on YouTube on the 2020 year of the nurse. And Go on there, watch it, make a comment. But we have entered it into about six film festivals and we've submitted it to PBS. Okay. And just to kind of give you a heads so up, we interviewed about 12 people and we got about six hours worth of footage per nurse. Wow. The documentary wow. was only an hour and 20 minutes. So I have lots of footage that I wow. want to share with the world because I caught it in real time. Real time, how they felt, what they were going through, even their opinion on um, vaccinations, because what's so ironic is when we were making this film, most of us were like, no, we're not getting vaccinated because of the leadership that was in place. We couldn't see the numbers. Nurses are evidence-based people. We got to see the numbers. Right. We just don't move with the crowd. We got to see the That's numbers. Right. And then after we got new leadership and we could see what was going on, probably 99% of the nurses that I interviewed have been vaccinated. 
because now we can see, we understand, you know, the numbers on how it was going to affect the body. And then we're advocates for education. If people are like, I don't think I want to get it. We start talking to them. We send them information and articles so they can make an uh, informed decision. We're not pushing anybody, but at the end of the day, um, you can see if you're watching the numbers that people are still getting COVID, but the rate of deaths are slowing down. And so, no. go ahead. No, go ahead. Sorry. So before we didn't have that, people were getting COVID sure. and we, we was just running around trying to, you know, do the best we could until we could find out how to contain this. We didn't know how long it lived on, you know, boxes and mm -hmm. um, different counter. We didn't know anything. It was just like, trial and error until finally we were able to see what CDC was truly talking about and we were able to, you know, kind of get a handle on things. And it was ever changing. So the CDC mm -hmm. responded the best way that they could. And, and, and you're right, there was a lot of um, misinformation and it seems right. like some social media outlets are being more accountable now and understanding right. um, when leaders say things that people really do hear what these leaders are saying and um, believing what they say. Uh, exactly. I know that a few years back that they were saying in the next 20 years, that there's going to be a shortage of doctors. I think we had a viewer that made a comment about, uh, yes, William Roebuck. It's estimated, according to him, it's estimated that there will be a shortage of 500,000 nurses in the next five years. So with that compounded with the story I had in, you know, you know, 20 yes. years, which is coming up, you know, from when I originally heard that uh, information, we are going to be needing some healthcare professionals in all aspects of the area. So this program that you are, you, this documentary that you put together, 2020 Year of the Nurse, would you again say where someone can go to view it? Well, you can go on YouTube and you'll be able to see the trailer and it's under 2020 Year of the Nurse. And also we put it in the film festivals, which hopefully in July, um, they'll start selecting and then it'll be a big, um, you know, viewing for everybody. But up until then, we have to wait so we don't get disqualified and PBS as okay. well, because um, my, my, my vision is to get all of this footage put together in some type of series or documentary series so you can hear these nurses in real time. And um, William Roba, he's the producer on 2020 Year of the Nurse, and he oh, has great. just been amazing. And he's a statistic logistic person so <laughs> all of these um, we thank you william <laughs> yeah yeah it's so important to educate people because you know you you in your own little world sometime and you're like okay if i live to be 90 and there's no nurses you know that's not a good thing and people no. are running from the profession now because of COVID. So we have to educate them and help them to know that we got it under control to some degree, but we have to educate on vaccinations and everything as well. Yeah, it, it's been a learning lesson for, for many Americans. Um, I just think that because we are such a strong country, we just didn't think that anything like this could happen. I also think this really made a lot of people understand what happens abroad we should yes. be concerned about because we are Absolutely. interconnected. You know, it, it really, really Absolutely. is. Our borders um, are open to all as other countries yes. are as well. Robin, where do you get the funding for something like this? I mean, it's well produced. So <laughs> what about that? Well, um, I will say as a nurse, um, you, you make decent money. And if you're in investing and saving, you know, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur by heart. So I believe in investing in things that can change, educate and empower people. And that's what I did with this. And, and this is a very courageous conversation. There are going to be some um, clips in here on discrimination in the healthcare field that p people may not be aware of. So um, I invested in myself and my husband, um, Christopher Roots, he also was an investor. So me and him funded this project and we had a phenomenal team because um, some people were filmed in other states because of COVID. Sure, sure. So, so the blessing is only the two twins that's in this project were interviewed together. Everybody else was separate. So nobody knows what each other said. So when they wow. see it on the big screen, it's going to be um, enlightening for them as well. So, Robin, how can we follow you? I want you to give that information out. How can we support you? Okay, if you go on Instagram, the 2020 Year of the Nurse movie, and I have a company called Closer Productions. It's my own production company on um, 
Instagram, and then Facebook, the same thing, Closer Productions, 2020 Year of the Nurse. And then I have my page, Robin Jones, and it'll be Roots as well. It'll pop up and you'll, you'll see me there in my, my list of credentials. So you'll know it's me. And um, I try to, you know, make sure I'm communicating everything that's going on because there are so many nurses out there that have gravitated toward this project. Plus, you know, just the community in general. So thank you so much for this opportunity. No, I want you to know as well for all of those that are tuning in now that the NNPA um, annual conference is next week. And guess what? Okay. They are going to replay the interview, Robin, that was wow. featured in the broadcast during the conference because that's how they feel how important this information is. Wow. So this is really thank exciting. You. Again, I can't I began the program based by saying, let's give her a big hug and squeeze. And I know in, in, yes. in a COVID world, that may be, you know, not what you're supposed to do. So I want you to feel my, you know, through the, the, the phone really, lines. <laughs> the, I, the, the feel lines. I, feel I just really want to commend all of our medical professionals who are still doing Thank it. Those who so have retired much. and came back yeah. to help those in need. Yes. Um, God bless you all, really, truly. So again, I want to thank you. And we thank know we're so going to give you the support that you need. 2020 Year of the Nurse. I hope that you give me an update and let me know about all the accolades I'm believing that you're going to win. Thank you so much. I will do that. And I appreciate y'all so much, and Mr. Cheney. And just thank you for this opportunity. And I salute our nurses and the ones, family members who have lost nurses. We love you. And we will always a nurse, once a nurse, always a nurse. So I know that there's going to be some other projects. So you need to come back on, keep us abreast of what you're doing yes. and how we as a community can support you and other medical professionals for what they do, you know, unsung heroes every single day. <laughs> Thank you so much for highlighting the nurses. This is very special to me. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank you. Let's give it up again for Robin Jones Roots, newlywed, a nurse of 30 plus <laughs> years, now a director, producer and actor in 2020 year of the nurse again robin yes. thank you so very much thank you bye-bye all right so the program continues you know we always have a musical or uh, an actor or actress on the show so now we're going to switch over we have a wonderful guest joining us now and her name is such yes s-u-c-h she is joining us tonight hello Hi! How oh, are you? Gosh. I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, are you kidding me? Thank you so very, very much. Okay, so so we're excited to have you on the program. Mm -hmm. For those who don't know you, I know that you are Haitian born. Yes, I, I know that you are a talented vocalist. So tell us a little bit about your childhood and how music played a major role in what you're doing today. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm a PK. <laughs> For those who don't know what that is, I'm a pastor's kid. Uh, so I grew up singing in church. I think I first started singing probably in the children's choir when I was about three. <laughs> and um, I think very early on, I just knew that I loved performing and singing. But I never thought that it could actually be a vocation because I didn't know anybody whose parents were, you know, entertainers or actors or singers or even like professional athletes. I knew people whose parents were doctors and nurses and lawyers, you know, the Chevan. Yeah. So um, when I was about 15, my band director, I used to play the flute, he told me about this amazing group called the Grammy High School Jazz Ensembles, in which uh, I auditioned, where basically it's a 10-day all-expenses-paid trip to L.A. Okay. And if you, if you make it in, then you get to be, I auditioned for the jazz choir, um, you get to perform at the Grammy nominee party, attend the Grammys, record oh, wow. an album, perform at jazz clubs all over LA. Like it literally was just the coolest experience. So I auditioned, back then it was VHS. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh my goodness, you're telling your secrets. <laughs> I know, right? Okay, so yeah, it was VHS. So I auditioned, I got in and it was the most amazing experience. I think it was the first time that I'd ever had like the slice, a slice of a musician's life, like really know like this is what it means to be a musician. And I just remember being like, oh my gosh, this is what I wanna do. I was also extremely intimidated because every other high school student that was there, they all went to performing arts high schools. Sure. They, all knew, they all knew they were gonna be musicians. Some of them were on their second and third albums. Like it wow. was just, and I was like, oh, I'm just a girl who can sing. Like. <laughs> You well, know? Where did you go to school though? Where did you grow up? Even though you, you were born yeah. in Haiti, you came here. So where did you start and then get over to the West Coast? 
Yeah. So I was actually born and raised in the States. Um, okay. I was born in Boston. My parents oh. immigrated here. And okay. but I grew up in a Haitian community. So, okay. you know, in, in New York, basically in New York and Massachusetts, where there are a ton of Haitian people. And um, and so, yeah, I went to school in Massachusetts, Neshoba Regional High School. And it was I just I'd never had any formal training. I just knew that I loved to sing. And so this was my first time in which I was able to see what a musician's life was like. And although it was crazy and hectic, I really loved it. So, so such yeah. I have to ask you this question. Now, Haitian parents, listen. What did I, I, I'm going <laughs> to ask you? And, and a pastor, what did they say when you came back from the West Coast and said, "This is what I want to do, girl"? <laughs> let me tell you. I came back, and I was like, "Okay, I need. I I now want to go to a performing arts high school." So I did a whole PowerPoint presentation. Wow! I, I was like, "This is how I would get there." And the nearest performing arts high school was about an hour away from my home, so I would have to take public transportation there. You know, and I told them this is what I wanted to do. And they were like, mm -hmm, that was nice, but no. <laughs> They're like, that needs to be your plan B or C or something. You know, right. and I am I think just from that moment on, I was like, okay, then music will just be my outlet. It'll be my release. And so I have two degrees in which that is not my profession. <laughs> there we go. There, now that's what I know. Now that's what I know. I yeah. said, oh yes, Haitian, Caribbean parents. Yes, you they, are going to get that education. Yes, I do. Right. Yes, so I do. My first degree um, is in exercise science, pre-physical <clears throat> therapy. I actually wanted to be a physical therapist. Okay. Um, and then when I started working in a PT office, they were like, oh no, don't do physical therapy is just too much. Like the PTs at the office, they were like, right. too much schooling. Why don't you consider nursing? And I was like, okay. <laughs> I went and became a nurse. <laughs> All right, so wait a minute. You know, we just had on. I saw. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah. That is so caring. Now, see, I'm sorry. I didn't have that in your bio. Yeah, I did not no. have that information. Yeah. No. So up until January of 2012, I was a nurse. Okay, so you said January of 2012. Yes. So tell me where and how things transition to you mm -hmm. being a recording artist. This is yeah. your profession. Yeah, totally, my profession. So um, because I'm Haitian American, when the earthquake hit in 2010 in Haiti, that was a pretty momentous event um, yes. in my life. Uh, just you know, being concerned about family members there, and I actually went down there as a nurse I had family members who had a hospital there and I was like in the trenches. And I don't know if you know, but whenever a tragedy strikes, things start to become a lot clearer for you. Like Absolutely. tragedy, I think really breeds clarity in Absolutely. so many ways. And I just remember um, one day just being out there and realizing that life is short. Like, I know that's cheesy, but I was like, yo, yeah. life is really short. And I've always known that music is my thing, but always been too scared to pursue it. Um, I always did music at church. I led praise teams, choirs, you know, all the, I've always, I always use it as my release. But I just remember thinking and coming back with such purpose that like somehow I have to increase music in my life, um, performing in some way. And so that happened. I came back and I was like, I, I need to figure out how do I increase <laughs> right. and how do I decrease nursing? I didn't know how to do it. And um, then I got pregnant with my son. And I think he was a major catalyst because I remember he was probably five days old, just born. And I looked at him and I was like, yo, I don't want to be the parent that lives vicariously through their child. Mm -hmm. I was like, I don't want him to ever look at me and be like, oh, but you didn't live your dream. So don't, you know, try to preach Push these things me. to me and don't try to make me live your dream. Right. So I was like, oh, I've got to do music. I don't know how, but I'm gonna make it happen. And so one day I was on the couch and I was feeding my son and a commercial for American Idol came on. Yes. And <laughs> something came over me where I was like, I could do this. I don't know. I could. I think I could do this. So I knew they were coming to Denver and I was like, all right, I'm going to audition. So I went out there. So I was a few months old and I camped <laughs> out. Listen, I camped out with the baby. Okay. <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I sure you did. camped out with the baby. I did. I did. I camped out with the baby. And <laughs> I had a good support, a good support network, you know, Yes. So I camped out with him and then, you know, I auditioned and I made it 
one thing they don't show you on American Idol, they make it seem like the first round is when you meet the judges. It's not. It's like the fourth or fifth round. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. See, thank you. We know yeah. for you, such. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and I've been watching it for years. I just thought it was the yeah. way they showed it, but you no, know no, television. No. I mean, do you know how many people show up? The judges can't see all, like, that's true. 20,000. They just can't. So <laughs> there are all these producer rounds before. Hand, which I actually think are probably the most important auditions when you're auditioning for the producers. So I went and I made it to the judges round. And um, and then when I auditioned for the judges, the year that I was on was season 11 and the judges were Randy Jackson, um, J-Lo and Steven Tyler. And was, I, was that her first year judging? Jennifer Lopez, it might yes. have, it was, I think it might have been her second year. Okay, yeah, because yeah. she, she really brought attention. Things had slowed down for the American Idol, and then they brought her on. Mm -hmm. And then, Something so great. now I'm learning that when we see them in front of the judges, you guys have went through two to three rounds before. So That's many. pretty big. Yeah, wow. it's, it's, it's a pretty big deal to make it to the judges round. And wow. so I sang, I sang Natural Woman, and I got three yeses, and then I made it to Hollywood Week. And um, that was a crazy, wonderful experience. Um, I made it to the end of Hollywood week where if you remember, it's where you sing with a band and then yes. eliminate yes. a whole room at a time. Yes. So yes. I was eliminated during that, during that time. And I just remember being completely just devastated. Like, oh my gosh, like this is so embarrassing. Like this is on national TV, you know, all these different things. And some people are really cute criers. I'm a very ugly crier. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I'm in that, that boat too. <laughs> yeah. and that's what they showed. Like later on, you no. know, they showed my crying. I was like, oh my gosh. But um, and I think one of my biggest fears and like trepidation of going on such a national platform was that hearing no on such a big platform would sort of crush my dreams and make me feel like I couldn't do it. And I think what actually ended up happening was the opposite. Um, right. You know, of course, I was devastated. I got back home and I was like, oh, and then I woke up and that one day and I was like, oh, but I still want to sing. And I still have a lot of things to say. <laughs> right. Like it yeah. didn't go away. Um, and so my whole first album was recorded in my basement. Wow. And I had no idea what I was doing. When I look back at that time, I'm like, girl, such you were brave because I had no connections in the industry, didn't know what I was doing at all what but just i just had this overwhelming desire i was like i have to do this and when i listened to my first album you know i cringe i'm like these vocal choices are weird you know what i mean the the production is not what i would want but i realized that had i not done that first album there wouldn't have been a second album there wouldn't have been a third album you know what i'm yeah. saying and there would have been nothing for me to build on or improve on and trial so and error when was that Trial and Error was the second album, yeah. That was the second album. So what was yeah. the first one? Stretch Marks. Okay, wow. Okay, these are interesting names. So speaking of names, let's, I want to take a step back. Yeah. Your name, S-U capital C-H. What does that stand for, if anything? So yes, so such, well, two things. Such is uh, the first two letters of my first name and the first two letters of my last name. Okay. My first name is Sul France and my last name is Charles. So oh, such comes funky. From that. I love that. Yeah, so such comes from that. But also I like the meaning of the word such because it can be used in two ways. One to amplify something exactly. and one to be an example of something. And so as I, you know, write music, I always think and it's always at the forefront of my mind, what am I amplifying and what am I an example of? Ooh. So, I love that. You're so conscious. <laughs> so stretch marks. Okay. <laughs> are we talking to us sisters <laughs> who are you talking yes, to i'm talking to everybody listen dudes we have stretch marks too let's not <laughs> you're right you are right um yes i think that there is such beauty in things that we sometimes are very ashamed of mm -hmm. and stretch marks are definitely a sign of growth and um and there's something that we should wear with pride they're scars and I love how scars tell a story. And so stretch marks basically was about, you know, the earthquake hitting. And it was, it was basically my story of the journey that it took for me to become such and to become a singer. It's like my origin story. Wow. And, um, and it's just, and I'm proud of it. All, of, all of the scars and all, because if those things hadn't happened, I wouldn't be who I am today. 
Now, Such, I have to ask you, I know we're going to talk about trial and error, but my question to you is, you went from singing in your father's church to getting two degrees and nurse being a background. Where did the writing, because you have to have, where did the writing come for you to be able to learn how to write a song? Did you have training or it just came naturally? No, no training. I think it wow. just, it really was trial and error. <laughs> Literally, I really do think it was trial and error. Um, wow in that uh, if you look at like literally the uh, progression from stretch marks, my songwriting to trial and error, and then my most recent album, Wide Nose Full Lips, there definitely has been like an improvement. I think it started <laughs> off extremely wordy. Uh, and then, you know, I got less wordy. And I think that, you know, and, and that's the beauty of being able, like every song is sort of like a timestamp or like a picture of where I'm at. And that's why I love being able to look back on albums and be like, oh yeah, that's where I was. That's That that was what um, intrigued me at the time. That's what my writing style was like at the time. And I think huh. that I just want to improve and get better as I, as I continue. So no, so many things really have been trial and error and been like um, stretch marks. The actual song is probably one of the wordiest songs I have ever written. <laughs> okay, like literally, but all been, you know, it's all been growth. And so, I'm so really how would you describe your music and you as an artist? Yeah. Okay. So I would say that I'm, I fall along the lines of R&B soul okay. with jazz and gospel influences. Oh, what wow. That okay. means, right? that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I didn't want to put you in a category. That's why I asked you because, yeah. you know, I, I think it's important to ask people where, they see themselves exactly exactly who would you like to perform with or do a song with okay so i've performed with robert glasper before i would oh. love to actually do a song with him that would be okay um let me see who else i think jill scott would be incredible fantasia i love oh fantasia. um do they have to be alive <laughs> no 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 i just i, I just wonder i i would love to do a song with luther oh my gosh because yeah. oh also I love Kim. Oh yes. I, you know what? I already your your vibe. I get I mean yeah, I heard your music, I, but yeah, so I see it. So I yeah, really that's good, that's wonderful. Good fit. So yeah. now that COVID is um in some places we could say it's coming, you know, the numbers are going down, obviously. You yeah. know, this this week, as I said before with our guests before, unfortunately the US posted six hundred thousand um deaths. How has what do you do in 20, well, 2021? What are you doing now? Because the markets are opening up. How yeah. are you getting out there? Because are you self-produced? Yeah. So wow. um, what's really great, I have a really wonderful team. I am an independent artist, but I have okay. a manager and I have a great publicist and uh, my band is incredible. So yeah, we're starting to starting to definitely book some dates, which is like, yo, this is exciting. <laughs> Um, I'm definitely a live artist. I have missed the connection. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I've performed via Zoom and and that's when I realized I was like, this is hard. Like so much of what fuels my live show is the unique experience of performing in front of a live audience and the beauty that no experience can be recreated, right? Like there's something beautiful about like when I, even if I perform the same show night after night, the audience is always different, that's which right. we, what I'm giving them, you know what I mean? What they need isn't exactly the same. And that's just, that's what I love the most about performing that I have <laughs> missed. So I'm excited to get back onto the road. I'm excited for performances to be able to connect with people. And I think that maybe like the nurse in me, um, cause like the previous guest says, once you're a nurse, you're always a nurse that never goes <laughs> away. And I feel like I've just combined like nursing with music and that this is my way to give back and to take care of folks. Well, many people say music is healing, so it's kind of neat hearing you say that. Yeah. So the title you just mentioned, um, Wide Nose, Full Lips. Yes. What do you Tell think? Tell us about that one. <laughs> <laughs> so Wide Nose, Full Lips really is a love letter to Blackness mm. and a love letter to myself. Um, I wrote this album over the course of like two years in which I really was falling in love with who I am. When I was a kid, I had a family member who told me that my nose was too wide and that I needed to pinch it to make it more Eurocentric because then I would be viewed as more beautiful. 
And I don't think I ever consciously like really realized how that had affected me. Mm. But I grew up thinking that there was something wrong with me just naturally, like with my natural wide nose and full lips. And so literally that album is just, an, it's an ode to myself and for all the things that make me me and me just like really enjoying all the things that I am. And also letting black folks know we are fly and we are beautiful just the way we are. So such with you doing things title, like you said, um, one here, trial and error, you um, have wide nose, full lips. It's These are things um, some people would say taboo that we don't talk about. What's your response that you get from fans? Because you have to be connecting when there's someone who looks just like you and I. Right. I mean, over, I think, you know, because a lot of people are like, oh, this is taboo, things are political. And it's like, I don't think humanity is political. I think that mm. I am a human. And as a human, I'm able to address all the things that humans experience. And, and as a Black woman, I get to address my experience, especially as an artist. Yeah, that, that's it's so important. And I, I love how you said you're falling, you spent the year or the time, you know, working on your album, falling in love with yourself. And I think, unfortunately, with um, the COVID virus, many people really had to look at themselves being by yourself. And, you know, do you like the people that you're with? <laughs> do you like the people that you, I mean, it really had you self evaluating. So you were um, on the cusp before everyone else was doing it or had no other choice but to do it, right? That's so true. And I think that COVID, you know, the pandemic has not left anybody untouched. That's right. I don't think anybody right. can say that they, oh, it happened and nothing. I haven't had to reevaluate or figure out how I want to show up in the world. I feel like for me, that's what it's done for me. Like, yo, how do I want to show up moving forward? What do I, what are the joys? And spending time with loved ones. I think that has been a huge thing for me that I think I always took for granted that I just would, you know, oh, it's okay, I'll spend time with you later. And now I'm like, these are things that are so important. Um, and I'm, I'm excited to move forward and see what this new world looks like. So how are you, how's the response been for people in the industry, you know, embracing you as a talent, kind of doing this on your own without any formal training, as you said before, yeah. I mean, you, you really got to show your skills by being on American Idol and mm -hmm. the whole world seeing you. And I always say, once you're on camera and they see you and you, you've gotten to that level of the judges seeing you on television, right. that, you know, you can't be. You can't be upset that you lost. I mean, you, you you know, there's tons of people out there. We know Lauren Hill was declined or or booed, and look where she is now. I mean, right. so I I love how you said you took that, which many people may have taken that as a negative, mm -hmm. and you turned that around and you continue to pursue something that is obviously in you and that you love. Yeah, and I think also what American Idol provided for me in so many different ways that I know they always show how like it's a competition and everybody's super catty, but. I've made some lifelong friends from that. Wow. One of them being Matheny Trico, who he is a phenomenal singer. He just, um, he was actually in Hamilton and he played such an essential role in my then like entering and foraging into musical theater, which is crazy. Yes, you did You did Broadway, um, The Color Purple, correct? I did, yeah. How I was that? Celie. So I played Celie in the regional premiere in Colorado and it was amazing. That was my first time ever doing musical theater. Oh I had never audition before. I didn't even know I could do it. And what, what was so beautiful about that was, I mean, Celie is a pretty incredible character. Yes. first character to ever play. I mean, yes. she is one um, incredible per Oh, gosh. Uh, and that was so touching and life-changing for me. And it opened up all these doors. Like, that's what has been so cool about this whole experience is, how one thing has led to another. And I could have never predicted that just by <laughs> me making that choice to record my album in my basement, that it would then lead to all these different things. And I'm, yeah, it's such, you know, I'm really blown away by you because I'm listening to the things in your path, right? Mm -hmm. And everything is the first time with no one telling you how to do it. Listen, remembering lines for a live play is not easy no, and not. I don't I, and then you get a role like that right I mean this is really who you are I mean this was meant to be 
you know? And I think that there's something about it in which I just felt, I remember throughout the whole process <laughs> of, you know, the whole rehearsal process of becoming Sealy, I was so nervous. I was like, how do I become Sealy? I don't feel like I'm Sealy. I feel like every time I'm on stage, I'm like, oh, would she do this? Or would she hold her head like this? Or would she look? And then I kid you not, two nights before we opened the play, it was like, I was Sealy. Wow. And there was something really beautiful. Everybody had always told me to trust the process. And I was like, but I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> but they were right. Because then I was like, oh, of course she does this because I am her. Believing was, in yourself. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Such how can people follow you and support you and get a copy of your new album? Absolutely. Okay. So on Instagram, at I am such, and you can see it right there. Uh, you can find me on Facebook, just search for such, and Twitter at such. And then my website is I am such.com. Uh, my album is available everywhere. So if you are on any streaming platform from Apple Music to um, Spotify, even I have a, my own Pandora channel, you can find me. Yeah. So are you working on any videos or any other projects that you can share with us? Yes. Okay. So um, there probably will be a music video, another music video coming out soon. My current music video and current single is called All I Want. Uh, go check out the music video on YouTube. It's pretty dope. And I filmed it during the pandemic. What? So, yes. <laughs> you yes. just keep going. <laughs> it was like, I was, I was like, this is the one thing that I want to happen in 2020. And I was able to get it in before LA shut down again. So... Now, such now I can ask you this. So now, what do your parents say? <laughs> oh, they're so proud of me, and they're so supportive, and it's it's really been such a beautiful journey with them. They're just like, yeah, this is who you're meant to be. So, it's so so exciting. Such national recording artists. We're really really proud to have you on the show, and a nurse. Okay, let's not forget that, and a nurse. So that is just amazing, and I think. Right now, people are still struggling to find out what they're going to do. I mean, I heard that, that in 2020, there were so many small business owners, that people who started businesses um, because of the pandemic. So this is a great sign to those who may not be sure about what they're doing right now mm -hmm. to, to step out on faith. Um, right. I'm sure you did some planning. I can't believe that you had your son with you. So he actually helped you get to the next level. He was he actually there with you. <laughs> he was with me the whole time. So many people ask me like, oh, is it hard being a mom and this? And I was like, I actually don't know how to be an artist without being a mom. It happened all at the same time. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. So is he interested in anything medical oh, yes. or music? Uh, yeah, so he's he acts, so he totally does commercials. He's also ah. very musically inclined. He plays the piano, guitar, and drums. He's really incredible. So do you play any instruments? I don't, but he okay. does. So you All know, right. it's a, you know, a family affair. I love it. Again, Such, we can follow you at I am Such. You got it. At I am such. If you want to go to my website, I am such.com. My Instagram is at I am such. And I'm very active on social media. So if you reach out to me, I will respond. So hopefully that we could see you performing somewhere in the U.S. before the year's out, right? Yes, for sure. For sure. Mm -hmm. Such. I thank you so very much for joining us tonight on FIRE. I really appreciate it. You've been a joy to listen to. And I look forward to having you back on the show. Thank you for having me. Thank no you so problem. Much. Well, oh, my goodness. I had two phenomenal guests on the show today and they're both nurses so i want to give nurses and medical professionals all across yes all across Woo! the country a big hand clap and applaud and as i said before a big hug because you guys deserve it i know it's not over for you you're still doing those 12 8 hours plus mm. hour shifts so you we want to let you know you're not alone and as a reminder um that nnpa is going to have their annual conference next week and they're going to re-air um this interview um, in this segment. And we have a special program from Robin Jones Roots who has um, 2020 Year of the Nurse. If you didn't get a chance to see the clip earlier today, you've got to take a second to check it out. Um, and again, thank you so much, Such. And thank, thank you. you. Listen, our listeners are the reason why we had you guys on. If there's a special person that you know in your life, in your community, and you think that we should have them on the show, simply email me. That's right. Taylor Thomas Anchor at Gmail. That's Taylor Thomas Anchor at Gmail. Until next week, everyone, God bless and goodbye.